Bostrom. I'm the director of Chiefy County Public Health. I see a lot of familiar uh, faces and names here on our Zoom this afternoon. I just want to take a moment and um, just express my sincerest gratitude to all of you working in the restaurant, retail, food, establishment industry um, over the last year plus has been um, an incredible feat. And I just am so grateful for your flexibility, for your patience, your creativity. Um, you've just done such an amazing job and I continue to be so proud to not only work, but uh, live and serve here in this county. So thank you. We're holding various sector meetings just due to the dra drastic changes in our state and local public health order. We really wanted to be sure that we touched base with the sectors most impacted by the new public health orders. I, I, I really hope that you'll find that the kind of new local order strikes a balance between the pandemic and our public health response and kind of getting back to what we hope to be somewhat of a new normal. So, um, you know, I, I start out with the PowerPoint presentation, just kind of lining out the fact that lifting restrictions does not mean that we are no longer in a pandemic. We are definitely not out of the woods yet. Um, so there, there, you, you may hear that other counties are sort of celebrating and, um, and commenting that the pandemic is over. That is not the case here in Chafee County and more than half of our state. So we do know that vaccinations are the ticket out of the pandemic. And yet we have so many variables that we are um, challenged with in our response. We are seeing breakthrough cases and breakthrough cases mean that someone is fully vaccinated. So either one or two doses, depending on whether it's Johnson and Johnson, Pfizer, Moderna, and 14 days post last shot of series, we're seeing people who are fully vaccinated, um, newly test positive for the virus. Um, the good news is that hospitalizations and deaths of these breakthrough cases are very, very low. So we know that the vaccine is working. We're also seeing a multitude of variants that are popping up left and right throughout our country that was ex um, to be expected. And these variants may or may not um, have the uh, strength to kind of beat out the uh, vaccines that we have on the market right now. So it was projected that by mid-March, the B117 UK variant would be the predominant strain. It took a little bit longer than that, but we are seeing that it is more, about half, if not more, of the samples taken are the B117. We also, you may have heard, had a few cases of the B1351 variant. Um, that was really concerning associated with our Department of Corrections. I'm happy to say that we have had no new variants reported in the last uh, week or so, which is encouraging. But we are seeing the P1 variant, which is the Brazilian uh, variant, take hold um, in our state, not in our county. So our state and regional epidemiologists are, are really keeping track of all of this to see you know, our, our cases, breakthrough cases, variant cases, our cases that are more symptomatic, variant cases, and so forth. But it's something that is on our radar and it is cause for concern. We've also seen an increase in incidence. No, not really any surprise, but of all age groups except for the age group of 65 and older. Now, these were the groups that were originally vaccinated. So we have that going for us. Um, and they do tend to be the highest risk. But we have recently seen a hospitalization surge for those 40 to 64. And slowly but surely, we're seeing people in their 20s and 30s hospitalized as well. Now, that may not be true in our county, 
but we are seeing those trends statewide and nationwide at this time. So we just really look at how do we live in amidst a pandemic that is certainly more and more seeming like an endemic. And you'll start to hear that term endemic, I feel like more and more. Um, it's when the infection is constantly maintained at a baseline level without external inputs. And so for us here in this county, switching our mindset to knowing that we're still going to see cases and they're going to be, and incidence is going to be with us for quite some time. However, have we protected our community's most uh, vulnerable and highest risk? And so that mind shift really plays into the latest public health orders. So it seems kind of like an oxymoron to be lifting restrictions while acknowledging that we're still in the pandemic. But again, this is striking a balance between living, um, living in a pandemic and getting our lives back. Um, so after you know, more than a year of kind of a restrictive environment, the governor went along with you know, uh, subject matter experts have kind of moved forward to the devolution of the bio and has allowed locals to make um, decisions based on metrics, based on culture, politics, economy, all the different factors that play into a pandemic response. Now, in Chafee County, from the beginning of March, mid-March mid for sure, we decided that we would take a coordinated and collaborative decision-making process in our county. So while local public health agencies do have the authority to issue public health orders in their jurisdictions, Chafee County Public Health has involved a wide um, array of stakeholders from our county, I mean, including subject matter experts, municipality leaders, elected officials, school representation, um, our economic development corporation, those that are supporting our business community, um, emergency medical services, emergency management, and so forth. So we've really, um, taken the most inclusive uh, strategy possible in our decision and policy making. We've met at one point, we were meeting Monday through Friday, sometimes on the weekends. Now we're down to Mondays and Thursdays. So just to kind of line out that we continue to um, meet and to brainstorm and to draft the policies that make the most sense for our county. And then we can be stricter locally than the statewide order. However, um, we can't be less restrictive. And so that's just one of the caveats that we've been up against. The variant, the, um, the gosh, I have variant on my mind, but the variance process that we had launched uh, many moons ago was part of that ability to be less strict, but um, to still have some guardrail um, available to us. And no worries about the PowerPoint, that's strange, but at this point in the pandemic, I think we're pretty much used to having IT snafus. I'll go ahead and um, let's see here. If someone would allow me to share my screen, Yep, looks like we are good there. I'll go ahead and pull it up. Let me know if someone would chime in and let me know if it starts going haywire. It doesn't seem that the viewers see the haywire. It seems to be only on my side. And I typically uh, start out if I'm sharing my screen. Oh. Okay, so maybe just a little bit wonky on my side. Um, I usually start out when I share my screen to say that if you see anything that you're not supposed to, uh, just kind of close your eyes for a second. I do get a lot of um, emails that pop up with some sensitive information on them. I'll go ahead and see if this works here. Okay. Looks like we're back on track. So again, 
the variance process was part of the state's flexibility on us being less restrictive when our metrics met a certain threshold. And um, so now with the kind of devolution of the dial, there is no variance process. Um, locals, counties could choose whether they wanted to adopt the same dial locally, a new dial in which some counties added level clear, level brown. All of this hearing what other counties were doing was a significant amount of mental floss for me. And as I was sharing it with our leadership roundtable, it really made sense for us to simplify our local public health orders while also being respectful of the state orders. Having some guardrails, but really lifting the restrictions such as capacity um, and, and so forth of some of the sectors that we just weren't seeing the spread of the virus there due to customer behavior. Now we know that we have had a bunch of businesses who've experienced their own small outbreaks throughout the course of the pandemic. However, in general, that hasn't been the source of transmission. And then some counties have just decided not to have any restrictions whatsoever. Those counties include Custer County and Fremont County. They are following the statewide order until, um, until they don't have to uh, mid-May, but in general, the majority of mountain resort communities have either adopted their own dial or have maintained some minimal restrictions. And so for those of you that host events at your retail food establishment, I thought it would just be important to line out what went into effect on April 16th, which is the statewide public health order for indoor events. And so the statewide order says that when more than 100 people are gathered in a room in a public indoor space, the setting may operate at 100% capacity not to exceed 500 people with the six foot distancing calculator that many of you have gotten to know um, when parties of unvaccinated people or vaccinated um, status is unknown. There is a variance process for venues of over 500 people. I mean, we're talking about some of these larger venues on the front range, um, certainly looking at you know, outdoor ticketed seated events, those large venues such as Red Rocks or Coors Field um, that really do take a little bit more of a concerted effort. Now, the indoor event guidance does not include retail food establishments in general. However, if you're acting, your retail food establishment acting as an indoor event um, venue, then you would default to this. And then in our local public health order, we really decided to focus on outdoor events. I should back up, in our local order, we really leave out this 100 to 500 person threshold. We really want to work um, individually with all of you if you are hosting an indoor event to just be as practical as possible around the event rather than have to be trying to figure out how to squeeze you know, 100 people into a small venue. And then, so for outdoor events, so if you are a retail food establishment that happens to have um, space outdoors where you can hold an event. The county last week did adopt a cap of all outdoor events to 2,000 attendees. And that will be, all applications will be reviewed by our Board of Health, which is our county commissioners, along with uh, public health, uh, to make sure that the, the current threshold and plans meets the metrics that we're seeing in our county. In our statewide order, the, the metric to follow is no longer incidence and percent positivity, but rather 85% or more of hospital capacity, both locally and regionally. And then any organization seeking to host an event will have to um, fill out the special COVID-19 section in the special permit application to the municipality um, and we are working on a toolkit to provide to 
event planners for that purpose. Again, just really trying to support a health and safety minded event. And then of course, each municipality could choose a lower cap if they wish to do so. And they have to follow all of the municipality permitting requirements. Whether we like it or not, we are still under the statewide mask mandate. So that lasts through May 3rd, and it's in essence in all public indoor spaces. There are some nuances in ours or in the state, in the statewide, it's when 10 or more people um, are finding themselves in a public indoor space and vaccination is unknown or it is, is not, um, you know, either is known or is, is just not the reality of the situation. We just, for the purposes of our local order, um, said that we just really want people to wear masks in all public indoor spaces. Um, except you know there are when individuals are participating in certain activities and so i bolded there individuals who are seated at a food a service establishment so um, hopefully that isn't anything new to all of you um, people can remove the mask when they're seated but not when they're walking around the venue um, either to get outside or to use the restroom and so forth and so with this whole uh, de de devolution of the dial, um, really previous restrictions become recommendations. And that's kind of a, a dramatic change from what we've been working um, in within the last more than a year. Um, so restrictions become recommendations. And there are no requirements for retail food establishments that are COVID-19 related. I know uh, Wayno would beg to differ as far as wanting to make sure that you're still to fidelity maintaining a good solid retail food program. Um, however, the um, spacing, capacity limits and so forth really are guidelines. And so we are invested to work with all of you to maintain as many guardrails as you'd like to continue um, practicing. I know I've talked to several of you um, who have said, you know, the spacing just really feels good to us. It feels safe. Um, and, and we really respect that. Similar um, buffets in which we self-service buffets in which we have not um, been supporting can take place However, it's a recommendation that there's reconsideration for that. I put the link to the restaurant um, guidance um, at the bottom of the slide so that you can uh, go ahead and search out all of the previous requirements or strong recommendations that truly now are just recommendations. Um, we really hope that there are some best practices that you have all gleaned that you'll continue. Um, again, we're not out of the woods. Transmission is still happening in our community. It will for quite some time. Um, and if you've invested in some of the measures to keep your establishment safe from transmission, we really do encourage you to continue to do so. And then of course, the five commitments to containment. This, this is just a good mantra for any sector, anyone in our community, when it makes sense to do so, maintaining that six foot physical distancing from um, one another, from various parties, especially when in, in the indoor setting. Transmission in the outdoor setting is less convincing but we are seeing spread from indoor activities, making sure you continue with proper hand washing often, you know, of course the, the face uh, cloth face coverings in public. Our, our order, it's, our local order sounds like beyond May 3rd, we'll at least continue um, the mask mandate locally through May and then assess where we're at and where we're seeing transmission. Getting tested, extremely important, especially if someone is symptomatic or they're unvaccinated, a close contact. And so we have plenty 
ample amount of opportunities to get tested here in the county uh, for free. Public health offers testing Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursday mornings. Um, we've definitely seen kind of a dwindled interest in testing. However, it's, it still is a vital tool for us to be able to determine what the risk is and whether we, you know, who needs to isolate, who needs to quarantine, and hopefully we can mitigate the spread of the virus. And then staying at home when sick. Fundamental golden rule that I think we've all been uh, guilty of in the past coming to work with the sniffles or a mild low grade fever. Um, hopefully, we've learned a lot from staying home when sick. And we pretty much did not see a flu season this year. So if we can continue that, then we'll see less disease burden in our county in the future. Then as I said, the vaccination um, program truly is the ticket out of the pandemic. And um, I know that with younger demographics and um, certainly there's hesitancy, there is un, uh, you know, unmotivated populations and certainly people that are completely against vaccinations. However, the race between vaccinating and the variants is real. The longer it takes to reach herd immunity, the longer the variants have time to you know, build stronger variants and, and those could be resistant to vaccine and to some of our other strategies. So while um, it seems like to some populations, this is no big deal, it truly is when you're looking from a public health epidemiological perspective. And so for those who are 16 and older, um, Pfizer is available. That's a two dose series separated by 21 days from first dose to second dose. Um, I did hear this morning that the trials for the age 12 to 15 went really well. And Pfizer did submit the emergency use authorization application for that demographic. What we're hearing is mid-May that we may be able to vaccinate our um, next wave of eligible populations, which is really encouraging. And then 18 and over for Moderna and Johnson & Johnson. Uh, Johnson & Johnson was on a pause over the last couple of weeks due to six cases of blood clot in um, middle-aged women. The um, CDC and ACIP met on Friday and have released that pause. And we are going to be uh, using this one dose vaccine um, safely for, for those that a one shot and done opportunity is, is the best for them. And so lots of um, opportunity for vaccinations. Public health has kind of moved its vac mass vaccination effort to host more intentional, smaller scheduled clinics and we are also happy to go to places of employment to be able to vaccinate larger groups as well. And we really want to remove any barrier possible. Vaccinations are free. And even with uh, public health vaccinations, we, aren't, we are not interested in taking insurance. We don't take IDs. We really just rely on the honor system to get as many people vaccinated as possible. And so um, other places to get vaccine are some of our pharmacies at the hospital when they're, they're holding their clinics. Um, but we really feel like we have vaccinated the lion's share of people who are interested in our county. It was paining me and my staff to see so many people easily come through our mass vaccination clinics from outside of the county sometimes from outside of state. <laughs> and so as we saw more people from out of county come to our clinics than in county, we really had to make a decision to uh, change our strategy for vaccinations. Um, last time I pulled the numbers, we were at 57.7% of Chafee, Chafee County eligible populations had received their first dose and 48.8% had received their second dose or are up to date if they receive the Johnson & Johnson. Um, out of a um, population of 17,439 eligible Chafee County residents, um, it's really looking like by 
the end of May, May 31st, we'll need to have gotten 8,720 Chafee County residents fully vaccinated. And by July 4th, uh, to reach the 75% mark in hopes of um, reaching some kind of herd immunity, we'll have had to vaccinate 13,000 um, uh, 13,079 uh, people in our county. So we, we still have a long way to go to reach that 75% threshold, and we really need all of you to help us make that happen. We're happy to take our vaccination clinics on the road. We do have a health incident trailer that will um, you'll start seeing at events and other public facing um, locations throughout the county. Again, just to remove any type of barrier. And I mean, we have more shots right now than we do arms to put the shots in. So we really, really, really are looking to our sectors who perhaps employ some of our younger invincibles or people who are just holding out for the vaccine. We're really hoping that we can kind of bond together and get as many people vaccinated as possible. I'd be remiss not to mention the Chafee's Got Heart campaign. Um, many of the folks representing um, the business community are, um, are part of that effort. If you haven't already, please take the pledge. Um, this is again, just really focusing in on those five commitments, the fundamental five commitments to containment. We've also issued um, at least 17 nominations for the business spotlight. So if you know of a business that has gone above and beyond in the last year plus to um, commit to those mitigation strategies, we'd love to either hear from you or have you get nominated by a peer or a customer. You can also access a toolkit. There's window clings that we have available for you. And we also have yard signs if that's applicable to your business. And as you can see, we have a long list of partners that support Chafee's Got Heart. This is one way that we can demonstrate that, hey, times are tough, but here in Chafee County, we can get through anything. and We can get through it together. I'll just go ahead and pause there. I left my contact information as well as we know, as I know all of you in the retail food industry have his. Um, he is going to be you know, available to you to walk you through scenarios if you're interested. And then of course, resuming our traditional retail food program in the upcoming months. And I'll go ahead and give you a couple minutes just to jot down phone numbers and emails. And then um, I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen so I can see what chats there might be popping up. Are there questions from the audience for Andrea? And I apologize, I'm going to get my second vaccination. So I am a passenger in a vehicle right now. So I apologize, but I'm excited to get my vaccination. Oh, congratulations, Christy. <laughs> How exciting. So I Andrew, think you'll... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, Andrea, I'll kick it off. And good luck, Christy. Watch out for that reaction if it's Moderna. Anyway, um, so Andrea, essentially, are you saying there are no indoor restrictions or requirements, but there is outdoor masking is kind of what I thought I heard. Indoor masking indoor in masking. public places, except for restaurants when someone is seated. So Outdoors, there's no mask mandate. Okay, but masking indoors is the only requirement and therefore, no no social distancing. You're just gonna the the business has to do what it thinks is best for the business. And there still is that cap that is in the state order. Of so there's still there's still a cap that six foot distancing okay. for indoor events. Okay. Mm -hmm. But for restaurants, that is not a requirement. It is a strong recommendation. 
Yeah, and if I could just chime in, it's much easier just to utilize that uh, six foot guideline. Um, the um, social distancing calculator is somewhat awkward. You know, if you look at 300 square feet, it'll say two people, for example. So much easier just to talk to people about maintaining that six foot reach and, uh, you know, social distancing and masks when not seated at restaurants like Andrea just mentioned. Uh, I, I would say that in terms of retail food, um, you know, I'm still doing my regular unannounced inspections and then wellness checks. I'm getting fewer and fewer complaints. So I think that's probably a good thing. Uh, either that or the public is getting very fatigued in calling us up. Um, but if today's any barometer, I've gotten three complaints about rodents as opposed to one about masks. So uh, yeah, spring has sprung. Thanks, Wayno. Yep, and for everyone who's on the Zoom today, you know, we're a team in this. We are going to really, you know, be navigating the next few months and we'll have lessons learned. Um, we hope not to have to move to a more restrictive environment. Um, we'll be watching that hospitalization capacity, hospital bed capacity. If it reaches, you know, it surpasses 85% due to COVID, not due to we had a, you know, a, another type of tragedy in which, you know, 20 people show up to the ED and they're admitted. We really, you know, this is COVID related looking at our local hospital, as well as the hospitals in our RETAC region, which include Lake County, Park County, but Park is, doesn't have a hospital, and several counties on the I-70 corridor. There will also be a conversation had with CDPHE if we find that we are facing that. It's not an automatic kind of snap back to a more restrictive environment. We'd be looking at the sources of transmission and taking a practical approach on, okay, is this happening among this sector? Well, let's work with that sector rather than have all of the other sectors penalized because of transmission in that one particular industry. Uh, Andrea, one other item I almost forgot, um, and that's, um, you know, I wear the hat of being on the Saleta Community Center board. Um, I'm working with Elaine and our group in order to um, reduce the risk of COVID at the annual Pibark pancake breakfast, which is usually the Friday, the start of Pibark week. Um, instead of people slinging pancakes and sausage and eggs and uh, trying to do crowd control, um, I'm recommending that we go the uh, breakfast burrito route. We have two people in the kitchen making a breakfast burrito, wrapping it in aluminum foil, putting it in a cooler, and thus minimizing the outdoor food handling, food transmission, no buffet sort of thing. So uh, we think we can still make a, a, a joyous public event um, outdoors um, and uh, and reduce that food risk and the risk of COVID transmission at the same time. Yeah, it would be great if, uh, if all of you working in kind of the same industry or similar industries can share trade secrets and, and best practices and creative ways that you have been able to um, continue operating, but you know, in what feels like a safer, more mindful way. We fully support that. And, you know, if there's an opportunity to reconvene in the upcoming months and to talk about lessons learned and, and practices, um, public health along with um, our colleagues here would be happy to, to facilitate that. You're making it too easy on us. I mean, ultimately what I wanna say is thank you. Your industry, kind of the retail food industry, food and beverage has, has really taken a hard hit. You see it definitely more so on the front range and in other communities. I think you all have just done a 
tremendable, uh, tremendous uh, effort in being able to keep your doors open while serving locals and visitors alike. Um, and I just really want to say thank you because you've had to deal with, are we at blank capacity or, or another capacity? Six foot distancing between tables or not distancing? When do people wear masks at the table and when do they not? You've really had to be sort of the ambassadors and frontline workers in helping us manage the public health strategies. So I just, my heart goes out to all of you. I really look forward to spending a summer visiting your establishments and, and you know, giving you a virtual pat on the back because it hasn't been easy. Now I did see Kim, Kimmy has a question. Did our vaccination rate include our entire population or just those eligible for vaccinations? Just those eligible for vaccinations. So at one point, we, um, that eligible populations wasn't in the data set. So we assumed that it was for our entire population, but um, the state did clarify that it's eligible populations only, which really is our 16 plus population at this time. You bet. I am so happy to answer any other questions at any time. Um, this will be recorded. Feel free to share it among you know, your, your peers. We are only a text, a call, or an email away. And um, we know and I and the rest of the amazing public health team have been working nonstop tirelessly since really the beginning of last March in preparation for who, who knew what was to come. And we're committed to doing so, continuing to do so, um, despite kind of this new era of our public health response, which really leaves it up to personal accountability, um, you know, responsibility, judgment on how to successfully kind of um, live in this kind of fourth chapter of a pandemic. But I can't stress it enough, if you haven't, or if someone you know hasn't gotten vaccinated yet, come on down to Chafee County Public Health or your other vaccine provider. We have ample opportunity to vaccinate everyone in our county right now. We just can't find the people to do it. We know that they're out there. Um, Wendell did make mention to the second dose reaction. <laughs> just think of it as a vaccination club. We've all lived through this. Now we can trade our, our war stories here through what happened post second dose. <laughs> it's not so bad. It's better than, it's better than getting COVID. All right. Well, I'm going to take that silence means that you all got what you needed out of this afternoon's meeting. Um, again, thank you for your time and your perseverance through all of this. You know, it has not been easy for anyone personally or professionally, and we're here for you. So thank you to Wendell and Christy and Angel, all the folks, Melissa is with us who um, Lori, I think, is with us. We've got a really good group of um, those that are rep representing the economic and business sector here on this Zoom. They regularly attend Leadership Roundtable and are advocates for all of you and, and liaisons and subject matter experts to pass along the comments and the concerns and the ideas that you all have. Thanks for your leadership, uh, Andrea. You bet. My pleasure. We live in an incredible county, so let's not forget that, that if anyone can get through this, Chafee County can. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Andrea. Thank you much. Bye-bye. Good luck getting that second shot, Christy. You can do it. <laughs>